and welcome everyone. Um, and we're so glad you could join us again uh, today. And as always, our desire is to do our best um, from the FDA's perspective um, to provide um, clear um, uh, recommendations and information um, that you can use uh, to uh, further the development of um, COVID-19 tests. And uh, to continue our mission uh, during this pandemic, to speed access to as much accurate testing as possible. Um, since um, I last mentioned that um, we had um, organized a further surge of resources into um, the COVID applications, um, we continue to see a success with that uh, surge and see um, uh, an increasing pace uh, of decision. Um, so I did want to highlight this week that since last week, um, there have been several additions uh, to our authorization, including more pooling authorizations um, that um, are especially useful, we believe, uh, in, uh, in um, trying to identify um, asymptomatic um, positive patients um, when the prevalence of disease um, is low in a population such as a routinely screened population, such as congregate settings or universities and workplaces, colleges, other uh, educational institutions. Um, we expect that once a regular screening program is initiated, um, that uh, you will um, hopefully rapidly see a decline in positives, making um, making pooling a very efficient way, uh, efficient use of resources. Um, please note all the caveats in our authorization about the use of pooling. Um, and of course, if the pooling um, scheme has not yet been um, authorized for um, asymptomatic um, screening, um, we do clearly um, state um, on the FDA website and we're supported by both the CDC and the CMS that you can use the tests um, that off-label as long as there's no specific limitation about the use and um, uh, very specific uh, use uh, uh, limitations to very rare uh, perhaps um, authorizations about limitations to only symptomatic patients. Um, we um, also saw uh, more home collection kits authorized and of note the first um, home collection for a panel test that involves both SARS-CoV-2 um, and flu uh, detection. And of course, um, we um, signal with that authorization our, our continued um, um, desire to see panel testing in all forms that are supported uh, by, by data. Um, we authorized another uh, rapid antigen test. We authorized more serology tests. Um, and so um, it has been a busy, another busy week. Um, we, um, we want to remind everyone of our, our current highest priorities. Um, this is this the priority is in two ways, one um, for review, but also in uh, seeking um, development of these tests from the development community. So that obviously um, uh, they, they really haven't changed recently. So they are again, point of care uh, tests, um, home collection kits, um, home testing uh, opportunities, panels and extremely high throughput uh, systems. Um, that allow the most efficient um, testing uh, of large volumes of uh, samples. And so that concludes my introductory remarks today, and I look forward to um, our dialogue. And we can open it up for um, questions. Thank you. Thank you. We will now begin our question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question over the phone, please press star, then one, and record your name clearly when prompted. If you need to withdraw your question, you may do so by pressing star, then two. Our first question comes from Randy True. Your line is now open. Uh, hi there, Dr. Sinful. Um, 
thank you for doing these uh, town halls. They are uh, very useful. Um, I have a question about um, establishing a, a primer set for LAMP. Um, I, I've, I'm with a, um, a public benefit corporation called FUDLAMP, and we are developing a, a colometric LAMP-based assay that has a has a, a, a ultra cheap front end um, and then goes into the colometric lamp. And we're coordinating with other test developers who also want to uh, open source our test to provide uh, very low cost scalable uh, options um, for essentially exactly the scenario that you uh, described above in terms of the uh, screening of, repeated screening of uh, asymptomatic population. So, to pursue these um, together, it's going to be very efficient to consolidate on primer set. And uh, for if if we establish a primer set and give a general right of reference, as the CDC did for their primer sets for PCR, then it's my understanding we wouldn't each of us individually wouldn't have to repeat certain aspects of the validation. And I just want to understand that that dynamic a bit more in terms of the the. Uh, uh, inclusivity uh, in the silico analysis and the in silico cross reactivity and the wet cross reactivity. Um, can you sort of speak to that and give us some sort of guidance as, as we coordinate on this? Yes, um, um, that's uh, that's we've seen that, that is um, a pathway that could be very successful. Of course, um, the Yale Saliva Direct was the, the first to. Um, get authorization, and I mean, we see a lot of interest in this sort of open source. Um, as far as you know, the data related to test performance, yes, um, um, that can be leveraged in a different, in in, in you know, in multiple ways. The, the two main ways are. Um, that, that if you seek your own authorization for the test, um, you, um, you can uh, give a writer reference for anyone else who wants to copy your test. Um, that wouldn't eliminate the requirement for them um, to, if they're a, a kit developer, say, for them to come in and get their own authorization, and it wouldn't extend um, the umbrella of an EUA authorization to any any lab that might copy that method. So, uh, looking at the saliva direct model, they have uh, uh, in their original submission um, and in any amendments, and I have to check what amendments they have to date. Um, they have an instruction for use. That's the sole basis, so so to speak, of their kit. And they point to off-the-shelf products that um, um, that users can uh, purchase. Um, in the case of primers and probes for um, their tests, uh, uh, Toby, you can correct me, but I think it's the CDC, and they can get that from um, vendors that um, produce primer and probes under the CDC authorization. So those are very specific catalog numbers. Um, and those are primers and problems that we previously authorized. So, um, so then again, there's these two different pathways. I want to lay them out very clearly. You can get your own individual authorization for a kit. You can then give anybody, any other developer, the right of reference to that, and they can copy it, and they can, um, and um, they can pretty much link up um, uh, and use the data in your submission. There are some elements that that if they were to be changed, that we'd want to just see. But if they are using the same suppliers for every, the same catalog numbers for everything that you're using, um, then that makes it very easy. Or the other way is to have this method um, authorized, as we did for Saliva Direct. Um, and then uh, you, uh, we would envision giving any you or any other sponsors the same sort of um, um, flexibility that Yale is actually the one that designates um, which lab can use their method um, and are therefore covered by um, their EUA. Uh, and they they have um, commitments to the FDA on, on what is required and 
in making that determination uh, of designation. And my understanding is they've designated um, quite a few labs already, and I would refer you to them if anybody wants to know those numbers, but it appears to be a very highly successful program. So hopefully yeah, I've addressed they, they've been, questions. And yeah, they've been an, our inspiration for this uh, for this um, modality and uh, and effort. And and I, I guess just one quick follow-up question. So if 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 we um, uh, get authorization for a test with a certain uh, lysis or an activation buffer and a certain purification, like we're pursuing a, a an ultra cheap glass milk purification, um, and but we're working with another um, another test developer who is seeking authorization for a MAGB based um, purification that would be highly amenable to automation. And so if we consolidated on the same um, primer set and and lamp master mix, then would would they need to re they wouldn't it's my understanding they wouldn't need to repeat the the upfront parts but but with respect to the um the interfering substances would they need to repeat that and then if we gave them a general right of reference then they would they would end up getting their own eua that they could control the designations on as well and then we would have our and we would have our own independent eua that we control the designations on even though we granted a, a, a right of reference is that how it would work at a high level, you're close. Um, okay. the, the devil is sometimes in the details. There are certain alterations to a test um, that we may require uh, additional validation. So if they're adding something new that you didn't do, say, then we would want to evaluate the data around that change. And then you absolutely developers can give each other right of references um, as they so wish, they can specify what right they have or among their, uh, from their entire EUA. They can have limitations or they can open it up entirely. But you can cross, uh, basically cross-reference each other's assays to the extent that you want. And there would absolutely be synergy. And, and um, if the components are all the same that you use um, for the core uh, test, then um, there would absolutely be synergy on, on reducing uh, any sort of duplication um, that uh, wouldn't uh, that that isn't you know recommended uh, because the tests are basically the same in those functions. Okay, I look okay. forward to uh, um, hearing more about your development. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Shannon Clark. Your line is now open. Hello, this is Shannon Clark with UserWise Consulting. A question about uh, point of care use of antibody test kits. The SureTech antibody test kit has authorization for finger stick whole blood specimens only for point of care use. This has led to a perception that venous draw whole blood cannot be used at that point of care. Does the agency agree with UserWise that this is not true? Point of care has the resources and capability for both finger stick and venous draw whole blood, but not plasma and serum. That would be correct. Um, there are point of care assays. Obviously, um, say physician offices can draw a whole blood and, and those offices are permitted to use whole blood um, in, in, a, in a point of care assay. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, um, it's a little uh, to to add a center view step for plasma or serum. That would be um, that would be uh, in all likelihood something different. Although there are developers who who look at you know devices that might be able to be used point of care, but in general they're not. These, these, you know, these facilities are not trained in using centrifuges um, and maintaining them. Okay. So hopefully that clarifies that. Thank you. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star then one. Please limit to all questions, just one question per caller. The next question comes from Wendy Strogan. Your line is now open. Uh, I have a question about um, uh, retrospective studies that are done for a rapid antigen test. Uh, the template says that there should be 20% low positives. Uh, I wanted to know how high uh, the CT values should be. Uh, and also the template says there should be five fresh samples if a retrospective study is done. 
Uh, do you still recommend that if the retrospective study uses dry, fresh swabs, um, not in uh, VTM, but that have been frozen? Well, the challenge is uh, on, the, on that last question, if you uh, freeze the swabs, then we've only evaluated data pre-market on, on frozen swabs. And then we wouldn't want to <laughs> require that users to freeze those swabs. Most clinical care sites don't have um, freezers to do that, and obviously it would be very impractical. So, um, yes, we are um, recommending a minimum of five positives of uh, fresh samples as the advice is intended to be used. Um, and um, we are providing a huge amount of flexibility in allowing the completion of the fresh sample um, studies um, post-market if everything um, up to that point uh, where we can make an um, authorization decision looks good. So hopefully that explains our, our thinking around, around that. Uh, for example, I'll just, um, I'll just go a little bit further. We, we have seen some potential evidence that, that free spa uh, may make um, uh, more target available. And so that could actually improve your performance to do a freeze. Thank you. And our next question comes from Griffin Soriano. Your line is now open. Hi there. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, yesterday at a press conference, President Trump indicated there would be tests coming in a uh, very short period of time, which won't necessarily need doctors to do the test. I was wondering if you guys have any color on that. Um, does that mean more tests that don't require healthcare professionals to administer the tests like we already have, or if you refer to true or counter tests for COVID-19? Can you state your affiliation, please? Sure. Uh, William Blair. Oh, investor. Okay. Um, so uh, this is this, um, um, this you know is something that I've been highlighting on on calls and in other uh, situations, and we've provided um, so-called OTC, over-the-counter or direct-to-consumer um, um, recommendations for validation. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, we have not um, um, authorized one, although I have to check always on everything, minute to minute. Um, but we're entirely open to um, a, a, a SARS test, uh, a COVID test that um, does not require a prescription. And so um, I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity to reiterate that. Um, we do, if you look at our templates, um, require a, a little bit higher performance um, when a, a physician or a clinician, a healthcare worker is not involved in the loop of testing, and that's because the consumers, the patients at home, um, uh, don't have the benefit of running the test results by their, uh, their clinician to make sure that they're are making the best possible interpretation of the findings and how it impacts their health or other people's health. So um, thank you again for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Christy Berkinson. Your line is now open. Hi, Tim and Toby. So this is Christy Bergerson. I'm from Exponent. And I wanted to ask a couple of questions about uh, artificial intelligence and the use of the COVID-19 assays. So we're planning to use a support vector machine to help classify our assay results as either positive or negative. And we were looking through the templates and we noticed some language. Um, we were wondering what extent of the software validation would be required. Like, do you want to see all the typical code documentation, like the hazard analysis, requirement specifications, design specifications, the, the full validation suite? Also, if we we're planning to have each end user calibrate the AI algorithm to their instrument, will we include that calibration in medical device pre-specification or the algorithm change protocol. The particular template is what has us wondering. It says that the software should be validated as free of defects. And that phrase caught our attention because the software's medical device guidance acknowledges that no software can truly be free of defects. So we're wondering how in-depth the software validation is expected to be. 
Yeah, and again, and this the application you're looking at is is a molecular um, point of care um, or home use. What was it? I missed that. Can you repeat. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Sure if you can, yeah, her line is closed. If you can, press okay. No, that's okay. I will. I will um, okay. attempt to um, answer in general. So, um, for EUAs, um, whenever software is involved, um, we are typically not asking for the extensive software uh, um, um, documentation that we would for a full authorization, and um, we um, instead. I want uh, developers to uh, focus on the most critical um, components um, prior to authorization, um, and that will somewhat be um, in dialogue with uh, with the review staff when they know about the details. Um, and um, so that is our, our our intent is is to at launch have no obvious um, errors um, in the software that could lead to false. Or inaccurate results. Um, so it is going to be a much lower bar for EUA, uh, and exactly what that um, the, rec the recommendations are um, from our um, uh, from the FDA is, is somewhat dependent on the um, the exact software and, and its intended use and its point the point of use. So um, thanks for the question. I, I think it's in, you know important, Benden. Not to necessarily delay a submission and go overboard on software validation, uh, but engage early and often, uh, or at least early, uh, with the FDA on your particular device. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Michael Triglios. Your line is now open. Check your mute feature. Michael, your line is now open. Due to no response, we'll move to the next question. It comes from Susan Sharp. Your line is now open. Um, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question to Anna, Toby. Um, this is just a quick question on saliva collection devices. Um, if there's a, a collection device or tube for saliva, um, that's, that's out there. It's not specifically for COVID. It could be for any kind of genetic testing, paternity testing, et cetera. Um, is there a need then just to uh, if, uh, register the device with the FDA and then any EUA that has been approved for saliva, that uh, collection device can be used? Uh, better, the best short answer is to say no, <laughs> but to provide some more color um, to that. And Toby, is this something that you want to handle today? Um, Where you been focusing on? You yeah, um, I'm, I, didn't, I think I didn't fully follow the question. Um, but if you're if you're asking whether you whether you only need to register and list, or whether there are other requirements, there generally are other requirements, especially for um, saliva collection devices for RNA um, preservation. Um, those typically do need um, FDA authorization, either in the form of um, clearance or approval or an EUA. Um, and one, just, just to follow up. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to follow up, because if it's just an empty tube, there's no preservative or anything in it, it would just be like spitting into an empty tube uh, with no coatings, no, no um, preservative, no UTM or anything. So if you are, um, if you are a test developer and you're including in your um, in your test uh, instructions, that sample collection is done with uh, with an empty tube, just a commercially available sterile tube um, that is not uh, not made. This, the tube is not making any claims, or the developer of the tube is not making any claims about RNA preservation. Then you, as the test developer, would be taking responsibility for that being a component of your test. On the other hand, if you are a manufacturer of sterile tubes and you want to um, market those sterile tubes for saliva collection with RNA preservation, even if it is a completely empty tube, then we would expect to see um, some performance 
uh, demonstrated with a representative assay, and we would expect um, that tube to um, follow the regulatory requirements for an RNA preservation saliva collection device. And it goes beyond just preservation. Any claim about saliva for our SARS-CoV-2 um, would, for someone who, who manufactures a collection kit and distributes it, would require um, a review by the FDA. Right. Yep. Thank you. And, and I think I made question. a comment on the the call last week, indicating that you know, making it clear that that if you're making claims about SARS-CoV-2, that you would need to have authorization. Um, and I think there was some confusion that if you're not making claims specifically about SARS-CoV-2, that you wouldn't, but that's not actually, um, that was uh, not, not the point that I was trying to make. I think I was not very clear um, because even if you are just making RNA, um, you know, just saliva collection device claims, not, um, not tied to SARS-CoV-2, you also still have regulatory requirements. Thank you. And our next question comes from Ludna. Your line is now open. Hi, Tim. Hi, Toby. Thanks for taking the call. Um, my question is uh, regarding um, the performance feature that is required in order to obtain an OTC non-prescribed indication versus an RX non-lab use claimed indication. Um, is it the asymptomatic subject NPA of 99% that is the reason that the current non-lab use tests are prescription use only? Is that the key? Um, performance discriminator that seems to be holding up true OTC? Um, so that, uh, that's an important question. The uh, short answer is no. Um, the uh, template um, recommendations are just that recommendation. Um, uh, on, on specificity of a home test, um, we would entertain a lower specificity um, uh, depending on other mitigations, which may be labeling and training and things like that. Um, so it is not, um, um, again, the recommendations and templates are just that, uh, and it is not something that um, is holding up um, authorization um, of any OTC uh, device. Great. And just one um, subsequent question. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry. I tried to get on a couple of calls. I didn't get on. Um, most of the multiplex products that are authorized seem to take existing cleared products and add on SARS-CoV-2. Um, are you guys open to receiving a test that is not an already author or cleared multiplex test that has multiple analytes like SARS-CoV-2 and RSV? Um, for EUA authorization, and my assumption there is is that for the non-SARS-CoV-2 analytes that are in that test, you would still need to introduce um, validation like clinical sample sizes that are um, equivalent to what you would have included in a cleared 510K level product. Is that a good assumption, or? You're, you're about 50% right. Um, First of all, absolutely, we are welcoming uh, any uh, new panels that haven't been seen by us before, as long as they have SARS-CoV-2 on it. Um, we, uh, uh, because they're, say, for flu or RSV, there are current full authorized tests for those, um, um, for those targets. We are um, asking for somebody who has not already gotten a panel uh, authorized by the FDA, full authorization by the FDA, and then they're adding SARS-CoV-2 to it. You know, some are coming with an entirely new panel. Maybe they're adding a panel to their uh, previous SARS-CoV-2 test EUA. Um, we want to see a little bit more data about those non-SARS-CoV-2 targets. And typically, um, it has been the case where uh, we have post-market commitments after EUA authorization to do additional studies 
um, on those target on those non SARS CoV-2 targets in order to bring it up more in line um, with full authorization and uh, enable an easier full authorization of those panels. So we want to provide uh, assurances to, 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 to everyone um, that the, the targets are working for those that have other full authorizations. Um, at the same time, we want to make, be as least burdensome as possible, at, at least in the uh, pre-market uh, uh, up to authorization decision. Um, and I would add to that that the uh, currently posted template for molecular tests does include um, that breakdown of what we would uh, be looking for for tests that are adding SARS-CoV-2 to a previously cleared respiratory panel, as well as what we would expect for um, multi-analyte respiratory panels that are not previously cleared. And I believe we have authorized both, um, both types so far. Thank you, Toby, and, and correct. And um, yeah, that just signals our, our very much willingness and encouragement of, of new panels. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Dr. Steve Kleibarker. Your line is now open. Yeah, thanks. Steve Kleibacher from Murafin and Viracor and Clinical Enterprises Laboratories. And we have an EUA for at-home testing, and we have concerns that as the EUA is drafted, we, there is some limitation in the channels that we can distribute through, and these channels would allow us to reach many additional people. So we think that clarifications needed are consistent with safety concerns and the intent of the EUA. And our question is, what is the most efficient way to obtain the clarifications or, if necessary, the modifications to our EUA? So if you're adding, asking about adding additional distributors? Correct. Oh, uh, channels, really. Yeah, channels. What do you mean by channels different than um, distributors? Uh, so uh, pharmacies, oh, for example. Yeah. yeah. Brick and mortar pharmacies. Um, Um, that will, of course, depend on your um, um, on your authorization. If you're a point of care a device that can be um, that's been deemed clear waived, um, there's going to be no issue with distributing um, to pharmacies. I, Toby, do you know if we ask specifically about that um, or require that? So, if you're being asked or being limited in some way by a member of our office, um, uh, or if you want further clarification, this is a specific enough question that I, I suggest you send it to our email uh, address and uh, ask for Toby and me. Uh, okay. Yeah, we, we've done that, but I, I will, I will re-forward. Thank you. Yeah. Did you say that you have an already authorized test? Correct. Or yes. Have we have an EUA for... Uh, self-collection, and then it goes to the Eurofins laboratories uh, for the actual testing in a high-complexity environment. Oh, well, yeah, if it's a high-complexity test, um, pharmacies would not be an appropriate um, um, place to... Yeah, use. okay, so those are distribution channels for the kits only. And so the kits, hmm. instead of coming yeah. from a Eurofins yeah. entity, they would come from the pharmacy whether they came from the Eurofins entity or the pharmacy, they would go back to a Eurofins lab for testing. And so we're struggling with yeah. understanding their requirements yeah. for letting them that's be distributed okay. through the pharmacy. Yeah, that's something that where you would just um, need to add additional distributors to your um, to your EUA. You could do that um, through your lead reviewer um, or reach out to the mailbox and um, we can help facilitate that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sam Eeks. Your line is now open. Hi. Um, thank you so much uh, for taking my question. Um, I have a question uh, following up on um, something that was talked about a few weeks ago. Um, the question, and it kind of relates to the new at home template for, for serology. If a specimen collection device is used with an LBT, does that, I believe Toby in the past said that, that it needed to be a legally marketed collection device. I just kind of wanted to follow up on that uh, piece. And, and if so, would the collection device then need its own EUA or could it be part of um, an, an EUA assay? Thank you. Sure, so for home collection, um, 
Tests for home collection need to be authorized. Um, they are not considered to be LDTs if they're, um, if they're for home collection. Um, regarding the specimen collection device, correct, it does, it does need to be a legally marketed um, collection device and it needs to be legally marketed for the use it is being um, used for. So, um, so in that case, you would need to, if, if a lab wants to use a collection device uh, for SARS-CoV-2 testing, there are not currently any um, dried blood spot collection devices that are authorized for that use. So they would need to come in um, either as a uh, test system or as the collection device, as a standalone collection device. And they would need to, to take responsibility, regulatory responsibility for that uh, collection device. Thank you. And our next question comes from Kimberly Zonker. Your line is now open. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, is very similar and it sounds like you just answered it. So I'll just go ahead and, and verify. We're currently using an LDT and the spectrum tube, which has its own EUA. Uh, but it sounds like if we want to use that uh, spectrum tube with home collection, we still need an EUA for our LDT with the spectrum tube for home collection. So is that correct? So the spectrum uh, tube by itself is not authorized as a home collection kit. Um, so it is authorized as a standalone collection device, but it does not include everything that we would expect to see in a home collection kit, which would include, um, you know, how the, the um, kit is distributed, how it's uh, received by the individual, all of the steps that an individual needs to go through to make sure that they register the, the kit with the appropriate lab and collect the sample appropriately, package it up for shipping appropriately, get it back to the lab within the right time frame, um, all of those, those steps. And there's um, more information on, on what we look for in the home collection template. Um, so the, the spectrum device, the way that it's authorized, it can be used it can legally be used in a home collection kit, but the home collection kit as a whole does need to be authorized um, to um, capture all of those other aspects. Thank you. And our next question comes from Dr. Jack Majori. Your line is now open. Thank you, Dr. Stenzel. Jack Majori calling from Loyola University Medical Center. Could you tell us, could we anticipate any guidance from the FDA as to how we as laboratorians are expected to assess immune status in those receiving the COVID-19 vaccination regimens, such as the period of time after the administration of the final dose to determine serologic response or identifying which uh, antibodies specific for spike or nucleocapsid viral antigen or the expected uh, signal or titer to determine the effectiveness of the vaccine? Yeah, so uh, of course, uh, the uh, Center for Biologics here at the FDA, CBER, is responsible for a vaccine reviews. Um, they have typically signaled that they are not looking at any sort of um, diagnostic as part of vaccine uh, approvals here. Um, and, uh, but I'd also um, refer you um, to them, um, but I believe that is um, the thought. Uh, now, obviously, that's uh, an important uh, research question. We have not authorized anything to date that would directly link to that. We've authorized some uh, neutralizing antibody um, tests. We've authorized some semi-quant tests that may aid um, in the um, exploration and, uh, and aid in the uh, research of this, uh, of this question. Um, uh, you know, we, uh, are, the, the, in, the, in the manner in which you can uh, directly uh, support such an indication um, would be a, a, some sort of clinical study that, that might be fairly involved 
um, and our focus, um, at least up to date, for serology tests is to make um, available um, tests that we think are accurate um, that can be used um, for the um, both the um, prescribed indications in the IFUs and um, make that resource available for additional research studies that may um, lead to additional um, uses for those tests. So I, I know that probably isn't too um, helpful to you. Um, I, I, you know, I, I do know of efforts underway um, to try to uh, address that question and, and the FDA would be um, supportive of um, the very least accumulating knowledge around the usefulness of serology tests for this purpose. So, again, um, I doubt I, I really satisfied you in my response, but I did want to be transparent to it where we are. Thank you. As a reminder, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. I didn't know if you had a follow up question. Thank you. As a reminder, if you would like to press, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one. Our next question comes from Daniel Ross. Your line is now open. Yeah. Hi, Toby and Dr. Stenzel. Thank you for organizing this again. So, Daniel Ross with Aptavid. We are developing a rapid antigen test meant for home use. And regarding the uh, better performance that is required to have this be without a prescription, so uh, sort of with a prescription or without a prescription, what is what are the differences in performance that you might be considering uh, for giving that designation? So um, for for rapid um, um, antigen tests. Um, in the home, uh, prescription versus non-prescription. Um, the prescription um, version can have some limitations. It may have an age limitation that uh, for, for studies, that validation studies are performed, say, down to a certain age, um, you know, that, uh, that the, the developer didn't uh, at the time uh, go any further uh, down in age, um, and then of course uh, we don't for any for uh, prescription-based tests uh, we do not have a recommendation to validate for asymptomatic patients other than if they want to make that specific claim. Then obviously uh, they want to make that specific claim that their test is uh, authorized for asymptomatic screening. Then we would want to see asymptomatic data. Um, but for, um, for every other prescription-based test, we do not uh, recommend validation uh, in the symptomatic population. However, if you go to an entirely OTC, over-the-counter, direct-to-consumer, where there is not a healthcare provider involved, um, the consumer decides um, who that test is going to be performed on whether it's a symptomatic or an asymptomatic, um, the consumer gets to, uh, is, you know, is going to be the one interpreting um, the test results um, for their situation. Uh, and so it, uh, we look for evidence that that can all be done accurately. And of course, in the home situation, the consumer to decide can do it on, um, on even um, very young individuals um, and on asymptomatic. So, for OTC claims, um, we are asking for, uh, and we're very, uh, the burden is very low here, usually a minimum of about 10 uh, asymptomatic patients um, 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 pre-market authorization with uh, sometimes additional post-market um, test, uh, uh, post-market studies. Uh, and then also, if it's going to be used OTC in the home, we have to assume it's going to be used on kids. And so we want to see that it performs well in kids and that it's safe uh, to perform in kids. So hopefully that addresses at a high level your question. 
and with some specificity. Thank you. And our next question comes from Kadumi. Your line is now open. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for uh, taking my call. Uh, we have applied for uh, emergency use authorization application for a serology test six months ago. Uh, religiously, we are getting a weekly update that uh, it is a low priority and it is in the list and it is getting uh, uh, will be looked at it as soon as possible. My question is, uh, is there at all any hope at any time we may see the light at the end of the dark tunnel in terms of uh, getting a serology review assays reviewed because we have not even given a primary reviewer. This is an emergency use authorization application and I think it is because of uh, the limited resources FDA has. So is there at all any hope? If you can tell us, I will appreciate. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, of course, uh, we have received literally uh, hundreds of, of serology, uh, in particular serology lateral flow um, submissions. Um, and it is a resource uh, limitation situation. With the recent surge, as I described at the beginning of the call, um, we, are, uh, we are making significant progress across the office and including um, the serology um, um, uh, uh, decision. So um, we have in the last two weeks uh, made, uh, let's see if I can do the math, uh, 20, uh, uh, 40, uh, it looks to me like about uh, 65 serology decisions in the last two weeks. Um, so that is evidence that um, we are, the surge is working um, and um, we're going to be able to uh, as rapidly as possible with the additional resources that we have. We have, with the last surge, we, we again doubled our number of people on, on COVID um, applications. And unfortunately, for those developers who have non-COVID applications um, into the agency, uh, at least some of them, um, and or um, will be submitting um, non-COVID applications uh, those applications could be impacted. So it's, it's this balance of how much resources do we put on COVID versus non-COVID when um, people continue to have other healthcare problems besides COVID. All right. Um, I kind of have, when I look at the list that is there as of today, starting from 415, there are only 61 uh, tests that are authorized serology tests so far. I don't get it. If you say last two weeks you had 65 tests, I'm missing something. I'll let, I'll let, I'll, I'll let you um, conclude on what that means. Um, next caller, please. Thank you. And our next question comes from Wendy Strogging. Your line is now open. Um, thank you. So uh, if retrospect samples are used, uh, the template says that 20% should be low positive, and I wanted to know how high uh, a CT value you recommend going to, and I also had uh, a question about um, for point of care rapid antigen tests, is a retrospective study uh, sufficient so long as uh, we also had the five fresh positive samples and uh, I believe the template says a five to six person study showing uh, that the intended population can use the test. So the, the five fresh samples, to, and I apologize to you or whoever else called before about the low positive. The, the fresh sample doesn't, you may not get, the fresh positives may not be as well distributed um, as, um, as, as we wanted as far as the testing goes. So you can distribute uh, the banks testing across the recommended number of sites and users. 
Um, so, um, yeah, so, and it's five positive fresh, not five overall fresh. We are looking um, for adequate performance in fresh samples. And then as far as low positive goes, that is going to somewhat depend on your comparator. We do, um, we, we take a look at the LOD of that assay and the cutoff of that assay to give you um, comparator specific ranges for low positive. So, um, so uh, typically that has been over CTs of over 30. Um, but there could be specific situations where that advice may be, be a little bit, little bit different. Um, and so um, I would engage with your primary reviewer um, or through the template's email box about a specific molecular comparator uh, test and what low positive means for that. Okay. Thank you. And our next question comes from Doug Ross. Your line is now open. Yes, hi. Um, my question is in the context of performance testing for direct antigen tests. Um, and the question is whether we do the performance testing uh, in Europe. If we do it there, uh, will that be sufficient or do we need U.S. Uh, test sites? Um, and related to that, is it necessary that the demographics somewhat mirror the U.S.? Um, in that uh, subject population. Um, again, can you tell me the the, um, the device and in, in deemed uh, uh, pre classification you're speaking to? Uh, yeah, this would be a non-laboratory use, a rapid direct antigen uh, test. Uh, a point of care. A point yes. of study. So um, we want um, uh, the the instructions, the, the 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 rapid instructions that are provided to the consumer, um, uh, to the point of care, to be um, tested in both um, English and Spanish. Um, typically, um, we allow that sort of study to be uh, entirely outside the U.S. Um, where possible, we would love to see um, U.S. based. Um, um, testing. Um, we also are, are encouraging, where possible, to include um, the pediatric uh, population uh, in, in good age range. However, um, you know, we don't think currently that there is a difference uh, between um, kids and adults. Uh, it's just if it is possible, we encourage that, not something uh, that will result in a, a, a denial um, pre-market. Um, so, in short, um, yes, you can perform that testing outside the U.S. Okay, and and, and just to clarify, just so it's not just the um, not just the human factors, but it's also the uh, the clinical um, the validation that we would be doing. Yes. Toby, um, Toby sometimes corrects me or, or, or adds color to what I say. Yeah, I believe, so I know that there's information in the antigen template, and I believe that um, we do for, so I, I'm, I'm not sure if you're talking about um, a test for the point of care or for um, home use or non-lab use, but for, um, for point of care where you would be at um, a, CLIO, a site with a CLIA waiver certificate, um, we would expect to see the um, the point of care uh, study done in the U.S. to reflect that setting. Um, for for home use or non-lab use, um, we would expect it to be reflective of U.S. users. And so, if it is done, if it is performed outside the U.S., like Tim said, we would just um, we would expect to see justification for why that is still reflective of um, of U.S. users. That's a great point, um, Toby, and I'll just give additional color to that. Um, you know, in Europe, the point of care sites in other parts of the uh, world may not be similar to our point of care sites. So um, um, we have seen, unfortunately, uh, quote, point of care studies, unquote, uh, done in high complexity type lab environments, and that is not a point of care study. We're looking at the types of users that would be um, uh, in the U 
U.S. for point of care, the type of users that would be home use in the U.S. Truly in the home, for example, uh, and truly in a point of care type situation with, you know, with non-laboratory uh, physicians and other health practitioners and, and other uh, primary care office um, uh, uh, staff type people. Thank you. That does conclude our question and answer session. And now I would like to turn the meeting over to Ms. Irina here. 